Yeah, I just, um, this is just gone blank here. There we go. Um, that needs to be back there. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Dad Talk today. We are so glad you're here. This is an amazing show we've been waiting for for a long time. Today, we are live with Dr. Warren Farrell and Paul Elam together at the same time. Fellas, how are you doing today? We're Good. doing well, especially since we're on with you. Yes, sir. Uh, I think Chris is going to announce our sponsors real quick. I'm going to pass it over to him. Yeah, so guys, uh, we, we've got some sponsors who are making this broadcast possible with these two amazing men that we're going to learn so much from today. Uh, the first one is, is an awesome lawyer that had an amazing show last night, I think broke some records on that talk. Uh, but Melissa Isaac of the Isaac Law Firm, uh, you can go to her website at www.protectingmen.com. And then we also picked up another sponsor today, a lawyer from South Carolina who got Melissa's stamp of approval, and his name is Cluck. And you can go to his website at www.clucklaw.com, and that's K-L-O-K, law.com. Uh, and he, he definitely has a relationship with Melissa, so you're going to get that same fierce uh, fighter for you if you're in South Carolina. So that's good news for any of our South Carolina audience. Uh, we are also sponsored by the Upstream Growth Consultants, the Father's Rights Movement, and the house champ, Yaya McLean, the man himself who will be in studio filming with us for the second season of Dad Talk tomorrow. Awesome. Well, thanks to each one of our sponsors, but gentlemen, I am going to get right into it. I was just sitting there reading an article a second ago about the boy crisis. And that said, you know, one of the biggest problems with the gender gap and the boy crisis right now is we're getting a lot of pushback from the Democrats. Would either of you like to uh, say a little something about that? That's definitely Warren's forte. Well, I'll, I will take that then. Um, I did go to, um, I'm, um, I chair this co coalition called the Coalition to Create a White House Council on Boys and Men. And it's a multipartisan coalition. And I've always felt that, you know, that, that, our children are a bipartisan issue and we should never make it into Republicans or Democrats. And so um, to illustrate that, I went out to Iowa and, um, and tried to interview um, each of the presidential candidates. And I did uh, interview seven of them, actually nine of them, seven, seven, of, seven of them, the interviews were in depth enough that I was, uh, was able to put them on, um, on my YouTube channel. And so the um, end, all seven of the, uh, the Democratic candidates were fairly receptive, especially Andrew Yang and John Hickenlooper um, and Beto O'Rourke and um, Mayor uh, Bill Blasio. Um, but their campaign managers were very different, very fearful, very hesitant. And their hesitation and fear was that they would alienate their feminist base in three areas. One is that the, they felt that the divorced moms wanted to be able to have the choice of, of being able to break up from the fathers and move to a different state, start their life anew, not repeat the mistakes they had made when they chose the first father. And they wanted their freedom more than they wanted the biological father. Then the other group that they were afraid of alienating was women, uh, women who were single mothers um, by choice. That is, women who had children without being married um, and, and um, either those children didn't know who their father was, maybe the mother didn't even know who the father was, or they had minimal contact with the father or among the children who had been born to women who had not been married, uh, the average father only is invo remains involved with the mother for about four years. And after that, the father and mother usually lose contact with each other and the children lose contact with the father. So what I just, um, and so the, the, the Democratic pre, um, campaign managers did not want to alienate those women uh, who they felt should have the freedom to be able to choose uh, to have children by themselves without being married. And the third group was lesbian couples who obviously did not have a father involved and they didn't want to alienate lesbian couples either. And so my response was, you know, wait, what are we caring about here? And they said, well, we care about women's freedom of choice. And I said, yes, women have just made the free choice 
to have a, have or not have a child. When you when you make that free choice to have a child, what you should also make is the free. You're making a free choice to do what's best for the child, and put the what's best for your child over your personal freedom. And there was just an awkwardness of response that I received to that, um, as opposed to when I uh, when I started speaking on some of these issues. Um, uh, one of my presentations was attended by somebody in the upper levels of government, who then invited me to speak at a in Nashville in a fatherhood summit that. Uh, was sponsored in part by um, people from the White House and, and HHS and um, Health and Human Services and Department of Justice. And some of those people heard me speak, invited me to the White House, and, and the White House has been working with me um, for about seven or eight months now, multiple meetings, and they've been very receptive. They understand that the, the, the nation is more in jeopardy um, by being um, jeopardized from the destruction of the family from the inside than it is from being dest destroyed by foreign powers from the outside. Uh, they have an, a, an inherent understanding among the Republicans um, that fathers are important and that families are important. An understanding that is shared by the Democrats, but shared by the Democrats that fathers and families are important only if mothers want them to be involved and they make that the first priority. So for the Democrats, it's women's freedom first, fathers and families second. And for the Republicans, it's um, fathers and families first, that that, um, that, that is the basis of, of, of a successful family of successful children. And I have to say that the Republicans are, the, the data proves that the Republicans are very clearly right on this issue. Now, what does that say about uh, worrying about, you know, who our voters is and losing voters versus actually doing what's right? That's that's the problem with politics nowadays uh, is what from what I see, we would rather not alienate ourselves from somebody, even though we know this issue probably needs to be handled that way. And I, I kind of find that a little disgusting, to be honest with you. Well, I I, I'd like to interject here for a moment, too, and, and point out that I think part of what Warren just described is due to his work educating people about this. The Republicans have been no more a friend to men's issues, men's true issues in life, than Democrats have ever been. I've said for years that we get killed with feminism on one side of the political fence and with misguided chivalry on the other. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. But I just to, not to blow smoke, but I want to compliment Warren because I don't think any White House has ever been aware of these issues until he started this work. Well, thank you, Paul. I, I, I'm just a, a little part of the process, and you know that your your willingness to risk a great deal to get attention uh, from people, and you had always suggested that you know the myth of male power came out in 1993, and it figured out everything rationally and explained the argument well, but it really got no it 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 had some traction, um, but actually, and you know, it, it didn't have enough traction. And what you did is said, all right. Um, the way the media, the you know, the media is a prostitute. I'll I'll prostitute myself to the prostitutes, and I'll you know I'll just I'll I'll, I'll make a big, big fuss and then force them to sort of pay attention, knowing them really well and seeing that in fact that was the case. And so I think that you know that we um, had different styles, but a, a, a very very powerful and important uh, one-two punch in, on that on that issue. And let me just say, it's pretty amazing, even though you both can sit here and say that you you have different styles, you had different playbooks, you're sitting here in the same interview now, and, and there's no animosity between you two, and you're, you're working together. And my question to you is, just like you two as individuals have had different uh, styles and playbooks in, in, in your initiatives, our community is the same way. You have some very radical people who are you know, just complete anti-government. Uh, then you have others that say we need to work within legislation uh, and and hold back on, you know, well, you know, the, the mothers are doing this and the domestic violence movement, like like verbiage like that. Uh, my question to you guys is for our community, OK, how do we come together, unify and complement the work that both of you are doing in a way that we're not turning off those 
liberal and democratic candidates. Paul, do you want, uh, do you want to take that or shall I? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll give one shot at it. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. I think when you point out the, the disparate factions that we have in the men's issues community, they all work, every last one of them. Uh, you know, you, you pointed out Warren and I sitting in the same room. Warren, without Warren, there's no me. Absolutely, it would have never happened had it not been for Warren's work. The greatest inspiration on men's issues that ever lived, sitting right there talking to you. Um, we need different people doing different things. We've got to have people working within the confines of the law, trying to change law. We have to have people trying to change political narratives, what Warren is doing right now. We have to have rabble rousers. We have to have provocateurs. We have to have people that are willing to take flack uh, in order to just get the discussion started about the issues themselves. I mean, that was the whole intent behind what I did was not, I mean, if you would listen to the media, I I'm sitting here right now in a wife beater up to my knees in empty beer cans <laughs> screaming uh, for my girlfriend to get me a sandwich. Uh, that's the media portrayal of me. Of course, it's not anything what my life is, is like, but that was sort of a little bit of what I decided to show them because I did notice, I studied all the way back to Belford Bax and I studied Warren's work and, and people like Aza Bobber who used to write for, for Playboy, who, who people who address these issues in the ways that we would love to have them listen to got poo-pooed too much. Somebody I think needed to come in with a big stick and say, you're not gonna ignore this anymore. And I think we'll probably need that for some time to come. Um, but all the different approaches, they're all needed and they all work. We're talking about men's issues more now than ever, I think, in our social history. Yeah. I have to say, I agree with Paul 100%. And this is um, you know, part of my background is, uh, you know, for, first of all, you know, Paul, took a conscious risk. He knew that when he took the, re, when he reversed what some of the feminists said about men and made it, made it set, set and said in his writings, let's, let's reverse this and see if we, um, if men said this about women, what it would sound like. And so he was often quoted as saying that about women without having the framework of the fact that this is a reversal. And so uh, Paul took a, a, an enormous risk. He's smart enough to know that this would be taken out of context. He knows what the media is about. But the, and the, but the crucial thing that he says that we have to all remember if we wanna be united is that the way of being united is like being united like the United States, allowing each state to have its differences and respecting that each has a potential contribution to make. And you see this in the, uh, for example, in the civil rights movement, uh, when Martin Luther King was first um, uh, standing out in the civil rights movement, um, it, he was mocked by the government as being a self-aggrandizing publicist um, who was probably a communist. And then Stokely Carmichael and Eldridge Cleaver sur sur surfaced and the government started looking at Martin Luther King like he was more a gentle, moderate person who, uh, who they could depend upon to say something that the um, average person could hear and that could sort of do, do some unifying. But it took the Stokely Carmichael and the Eldridge Cleaver to make Martin Luther King look good. Uh, when uh, when the, in the women's movement, um, I was deeply involved as many people know um, in, on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City. And we had the red stockings um, and, and radical socialists um, who, were, um, who were saying destroy the family and, and that the family is just a patriarchal system that is meant to destroy women. And then we had the National Organization for Women which said that's not accurate, but we, they didn't argue the inaccuracy of it. They just focused on legislation and things that they could do within the framework of the system, not trying to develop a socialist system, but trying to develop an equal amount of power for women within the framework of the capitalist system. And now looked radical until the, social, until the Socialist Workers Party and the Red Stockings and other groups like them, um, and people like um, that, that wrote this society 
for cutting out men uh, manifesto. Um, the, you know, they looked really radical, but that made now look all the more conservative. Whereas you took now alone, and they look they looked radical. And so the, it takes multiple players um, to um, to allow people. Um, you know, it wasn't until uh, it, before Paul arrived, I was you know the myth of male power made a splash, and then it just sort of died out. And it would have been ignored for quite for quite some probably forever, uh, were it not for Paul stepping in there and taking the risks that he did. So um, Paul and I have worked, you know, very much a hand in glove, and you know our different styles. We have different personalities, and 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 ideologies and and styles emerge from personalities. And our job is to see the value of each of them and acknowledge each other, rather than saying, "Oh, you know, Paul's bad, I'm good. Paul's uh, Warren's bad, I'm good." Yes, sir. And Paul and Warren, there's there's something I'd really like to touch on. Uh, something I see a lot when we're talking about men's rights, you get some of these guys in there that are just completely against women. You, you can't say anything about that. It's got to be 100% men's rights. Uh, and if you mention anything about a woman, you're not a true men's rights activist. I even saw some of the comments I was looking on your YouTube cha channel, Paul. I was like, some of these guys just don't get it, how it hurts us when they go so extreme. What is some of the the things they are doing when they, you know, don't allow themselves to have the other side of that conversation when we're speaking to them. Well, one of the things I want to say about that is that it is it very, very, very important to allow those guys their voice. Understand, people get into the men's movement often pulling knives out of their back from family courts, from relationships gone south. They're hurting. They're, they're suffering in emotionally. And it, it, it makes sense. It's not fair that they would point all this at women. And yes, I've seen the comments too. We have weekly discussions with Janice Fiamingo and there's always somebody in the audience that says, get rid of Janice or, or, or something like that. Of course, I obviously disagree with that and I don't think it's helpful, but the thing is, so many men have, we talk about these issues almost in abstract ways of what's happening. Look at the suicide rate. Well, in suicide, there's a lot of despondency. A lot of these guys are on the edge and they're angry. And sometimes human beings, when their cup is full, they just have to be able to spill some out to make room for anything else. They need to be able to vent until there's an opportunity to look at things differently, to get through their grieving, because so much of this for men is a grieving process when their eyes are open to the issues and to what's happened to them. They're not just grieving the pain that was inflicted on them, they're grieving everything they've ever believed in their lives about themselves, about women, about marriage, about justice, all these things come together. And man, if we can't let those guys vent um, and of course, feminists take this and turn those guys into a threat narrative. Oh, they're Elliot Roger, wedding to happen, all of them. It's nonsense. The best thing we can do is allow them to speak and to tell them, hopefully educate them, that after they've had time to vent this anger, that there's life beyond that. Just let them know that. And hopefully that plants a seed that down the road, when they've had a chance to vent some of that anger, they can look at life a little bit more different, and they might even come back to my channel and enjoy the brilliance of Janice Fiamingo. I, again, couldn't agree with Paul more. Um, most people don't know that Paul is a therapist and that um, I, I, and I teach couples communication workshops all around the country. And I just came back from teaching one this past uh, weekend. And one of the themes, two of the themes that I talk about in the couples communication workshop is one is that anger is vulnerability's mask. And if we, if we look at an angry person, whether it's your partner or someone in society, almost always, and Paul described it perfectly, there is such, there's idealism followed by disappointment and hurt and rejection. And the most important single thing that we need to do for someone who's angry is to hear them and then let them know that we've heard them 
and then ask them when we've heard them or when we feel we've heard them, if we've distorted anything. And when they say that they did feel distorted, whether or not we feel we got it right, just keep working at it until they don't feel distorted. When you hear some, and then ask them if, there's, if you've missed anything, and then keep working at it until they say you didn't distort anything, you didn't miss anything, I feel understood. Don't tell somebody you understand them. Let them tell you they feel understood. And when you get to, you know, when, when I have husbands and wives, I had just in the last couple's workshop, I, I did this place called 1440 Multiversity in California. And somebody walked up to me after the workshop and said, just, she came up and hugged me and she said, I want you to know, Warren, I filed for a divorce on Friday. I am unfiling for that divorce today. And that this is the first time I've had my, my husband really understand what was upsetting me and what was bothering me and the way I feel about the children. And, um, and, and now that I see that he can really hear me, and I also see some of the things that were pa paining him, and I really learned to listen to him rather than argue with him, um, I want to, to remain married to him. And her husband happened to walk up, see the two of us talking and say, what are you guys talking about? And explained, and he goes, um, yes, yes. And he just put his arms around me. This is a guy that looks like a football player and, but is, you know, and, and is an attorney, in fact. And, he, um, and he's not the hug type. Um, but he just put his arms around me and said, thank you for what you've done for not just me and her, but also for our children, because they're nine and they're 11. Uh, one's a boy and one's a girl. And I know that they would um, that, that that they would not want. They, I know that they want us to stay together because the boy is acting out. Uh, whenever he hears us argue, he goes into depression and he gets alienated, and he feels he can't trust either one of us. And um, you know that this has been so helpful. So the point of all this is that when you hear anger, see the vulnerability behind the anger, and instead of arguing, listen. And instead of just listening ask if you've distorted or heard everything completely, ask if you've missed anything. And I have never seen anyone increase their anger when they feel understood. So if you want to solve the problem of an angry attacking person, start with listening, continue with listening and end with listening. Yes, sir. And you speak about that vulnerability. So I, I'd like to ask you, you know, I think a lot of times where a woman would just cry and show her emotions, that stereotype against the dad that he's not supposed to cry, you got to be tough, you got to suck it up. And then what you're seeing is a hurt person and they come at you very extreme. And a lot of times I think guys when they see you getting really angry like that, they think, oh, this is a, you know, a lot of people would put that as a bad person that's coming mm -hmm. at you it's probably somebody that's just really really hurt and doesn't know how to get over this situation and that's the only thing they know how to do so um it can be hard to deal with them sometimes i mean we've definitely had them come to the page but i understand it and you know yeah. it's okay to show your emotions guys it um, is hard to deal with them sometimes i agree with that but i would caution anyone to really heed what warren's talking about it's so much easier to deal with somebody that's angry when you stop what you're doing and treat them as though what is hurting them is important for you to hear. If you dismiss them or look, you're gonna give us a bad name or you shouldn't bring that here, what you're doing is what everybody else in their life has already been doing to them. They're used to it. It's another one of those knives in their back. But when you stop and you make sure that you're listening them until you can hear and importantly until they know you're listening to their pain, they will get to their pain almost every time. Yes. But first, you have to be able to embrace what they're feeling. We tell men all the time, you need to express what you're feeling. And then men start talking and often it starts with anger. And then what does society do? Oh, we don't want that feeling. Mm -hmm. we, want, we want feelings that are more easy for us and more comfortable for us. Mm -hmm. And they do this to men in particular. Stop and just listen. You can replay this <laughs> video. Go over what Warren said. He gave you the perfect roadmap of what to do with angry men. And I really appreciate that, guys, really, because I mean, I'll, I'll, I won't lie to you. I've been guilty of it when they come. It's like I don't know how to deal with it. So it's just like try to ignore and let it go its other way. And that's not fixing anything. Yeah. So uh, I really appreciate that advice. Ask, uh, ask, ask oh, go ahead. Specifically, you know, talk to me about your, were you, were you married? 
uh, talk to me about your your marriage talk to you did you have children talk to me about your children i have seen men go from angry bitter legalistic technical and then i asked them to pull out their they did they have children yes this is what's happened they i said can i see pictures of your children and i just asked for pictures of their children and this this anger just turns into tears and they're crying all over the place and you see the, uh, but you have to ask specific questions. If you say to a man, tell me your feelings, oftentimes men just go, um, they, 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 you, what you wanna get at is their feelings, but you can't ask them to, you, you can't use the word feelings to access their feelings. You have to ask them about specific things in their life that created the feelings, the hurts, the pain, and they will get, they will get at it through describing those specifics. And one thing I'd like to bring up is, especially in our community, there's been plenty of people that I've personally conversed with uh, and really listened to and, and tried to uh, inspire them and help raise them up. Uh, and I, I'd feel wrong if we didn't say there's got to be some self ownership in it for the person, because one thing that I would like both of your opinions on is a lot of people tend to get stuck in that anger and that misery. And I know while we're saying, yes, it's okay for you to have those emotions, I feel like there's a healthy point of when those emotions end and you start moving forward and trying to better your life and get involved and maybe speak out. Uh, but I, as sitting here talking to you guys, I can think of three or four people uh, who, who I know that are just stuck in that anger phase. And this mm. is just the way this is. Women are evil. And, and I know we don't want that. So what advice could you give to those people who are stuck there? Because I know I've, I've done everything I can to listen and it's more of a self-ownership and a willingness thing for them to move forward. Uh, what are your thoughts and advice? I do have some thoughts, but Paul, I just spoke. Um, you wanna say anything? Yeah. Well, sure, yeah. Um, one thing I can talk just about life in general and I can talk in, in terms of my counseling work. One of the things that I always have to know about, you're, you're talking about where did we go from healthy expression of anger to dwelling or wallowing in it and, and turning it into something unhealthy. One of the things I always have to remember is that I'm not the arbiter of that point in a person's life. I can never be that arbiter. I don't think, I mean, there's obviously there's gonna be some people who would, I think, qualify for what most of us would call wallowing. I don't think that's the case in the great majority of times. I think a lot of times you're dealing with family of origin issues where people have been told not to talk. You're talking about um, men adhering to the expectations of men in a, a real, real strong way because to show vulnerability is a huge risk for them. Um, I think it, it really goes back to understanding you need to get them to talk. And, and there's something on the internet that's like really hard to do. You can't do that in your comment section very much. But what I do when guys express anger, I, I upvote their comment unless they're making a violent threat or something like that. But if they're just expressing how rotten things were to them, even if it's, I know it's the 10th or 20th time that I've seen them in the comments doing that, I upvote the comment and just comment and say, I hear you. It, it, and that's all I can do. And I have seen times where that resulted, or at least down the road from that, that those guys start talking about more about the pain and more about other things than their anger and their bitterness over what's happening. I think that we make way too much of men's anger in this culture. We have way too much fear of angry men that's promulgated by the media. Men have reasons to be angry. They have lots of them. Um, and I really think that my default setting is to honor that, not to worry so much about whether or not they're wallowing or, or whatever. And at the same time, if you look through the body of my work, you'll see an expression used over and over again. There are no victims, only volunteers. We are all accountable for what's happening in our lives, all of us. And I never hesitate that to say people, but I don't use it as a weapon on a guy who's raging. That's not the right time. It gets into sort of a little more complicated area, but that's what I'll throw in for now and 
let Warren speak. Yeah, I, again, 100% agree with Paul, uh, who's articulating what I would call a feelings paradox. And the, you know, the first part of the paradox is to let it all out. And the second part of the paradox is to know that ultimately there's accountability. And uh, one of the ways of making that transfer from letting it all out is first of all, making sure that you're allowing, you're drawing the man out. You're not just responding to him. You're asking him for more information and what's the story behind that and how did that happen? And, and then you're sharing with him uh, the pain that my, uh, that, that my God, if I, you know, if I, I can't imagine what it must have been like to, to have been divorced and to have lost your wife and then lost your children at the same time. And this is everything you've loved that you've lost in one shot. You only have to say something as simple as that. And, the, and you will see that the response in the next comment will be some version of, oh my God, thank you so much. <laughs> it's sort of like there, you, could feel, you could feel even via the internet, this different emotional response. Now, secondly, as you think that if you wanna test where we make this transition to accountability, ask the man a question like this. Uh, so if you were a mentor, if you were, if you were the mentor to yourself, uh, what would you as mentor advise to yourself listening to you? Uh, what, what, what would be your advice? Men are very good at giving advice and, 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 and they like doing, they like changing things. And so when you give them a handle of being a mentor to themselves, they can often go off on a different um, track of saying, well, I guess if I were mentoring myself, what I would say is to um, that I need to be accountable. That what I would say is that uh, if I if I cry and whine too much, that people won't hear me, and I'll reinforce the problem that I've created. And they get it as soon as they move into the mentoring of themselves role, um, but they didn't get it five minutes before. So first, hear them out. Second, get their story. Third, empathize with the specifics. And then fourth, ask them to mentor themselves and you will find a man that will usually make a very powerful transition. I might get a little heat for this comment, but I just gotta ask, um, why is it that when women get angry, people listen to them, but when a, a, a man gets angry, we run away from it? Because we are biologically programmed to protect women. And so when women get angry, we, feel, we see their vulnerability right away. When men get angry, we fear that that anger may be, that, that has the, the power of the man physically that has been used to protect women and to create the female privilege of women not having to go to war and be killed otherwise might be turned against the woman or be turned against the society. And so, and we're biologically programmed to, to abhor any man that's a threat to us physically um, because he must always use that threat, that power that he has to protect women, not in any way threaten women. Paul, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, what Warren said, I recall John, late John Bradshaw used to always refer to the gorilla on the putting green uh, with the driver in his hand. Uh, and that biological predisposition, our predisposition to rescue women, to take care of them, it turns into a sort of psychosis culturally that we glorify their anger. They, they take guys through ruinous, horrible divorces, take their children, and we say, you go, girl. Take him to the cleaners. We glorify that kind of behavior. And this is, I think, uh, a really, uh, what an, a super response is the term for it. We, you, Peter Wright and I have used this term in describing super stimuli and super response mechanisms in human beings. And it's Tom Golden talks about this, that if you see a woman alone in a diner crying, people will converge around her. People will come up and say, can I help? And if they see a man alone in a diner crying, they'll say, better stay away from that guy. Mm -hmm. There's something and, wrong there. And, and he's a potential loser. Yep. Uh, and if you see a woman crying and you're a man who, and that woman is attractive, you use those cry, that, that vulnerability of the woman to go up and play rescuer, to play hero, to play empath empathizer. Whereas if you see a woman sees a man crying, her response is weak and not anybody that I want to be associated with. Um, and so it's a very, very different um, response uh, between the two for sure. 
Well, you just got a definition of many male feminists. <laughs> yes. gotcha. And I'll do one more thing on that issue. The um, we have, you know, I you know, um, Eric and Chris that I was on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women yes, in New York City, and I was, you know, a leading male feminist, as you know. And so I, I'm so sad when I was a, when I was deeply involved in the feminist movement. The, the basic motto is. You know, I am woman, I am strong, as Helen Reddy sang in that song, I am woman, I am strong. And now it's, I am woman, I've been wronged. And you know, we have, we have begun to hone victimhood as a fine art. And, that, and we've developed a concept of victim power. And, when, when, and when, the, when women put out things like hashtag believe women, and so as if any woman who says she's a victim has only her story to tell, and any man that might have a different perspective should not be believed. And this is, believe it or not, what President Obama basically wrote to uh, in his um, dear colleague letter to all the university presidents, uh, saying that if, if a woman on campus says she's been, uh, uh, makes an accusation of sexual harassment or date rape, <coughs> that we should start out, we should always start with believing her. And we should, uh, and the result of that was, well, that's a good, you know, that's maybe even something I would agree with, start out by believing her. But to follow up on that and eliminate the due process for the man to be able to say, uh, to cross-examine the woman, which is part of our constitutional right, um, is that is where it goes too far. And so we, and, and so we have developed uh, what others have called, and I agree with, a victim industrial complex uh, where there's, a, tens of thousands of people who are making their living from, um, from, from the defense of women um, in court, the defense of women in, um, in child custody cases, uh, the defense of the, vic the victim, and appealing to the biological instincts that we all have to protect women, and then saying that men have the power as opposed to understanding that actually, if you're biologically programmed to protect somebody, that person who's protected has the power. Let me yeah. add one other quick thing to that too that I think is a benefit. I mean, at first, when you look at the reality of our expectations and treatment of men and women respectively, you see that for men getting attention to their problems, it's a real disadvantage. They are, they are limited from the beginning of getting attention to anything that's wrong. On the other hand, when you look at the men's rights movement or the men's movement or however you want to term it, it's why you don't see an ism. We don't have men in ism. I mean, there's some guys that identify as that, but it, it never got any traction. We're not ideological. This isn't about being another victim identity complex. It is about accountability ultimately for everybody involved. Uh, we have to have that. And I think that makes this movement a lot healthier than feminism. And I hope it stays on that track because when we start becoming victims, um, one, that won't work very well for men <laughs> as we'll see. But number two, it's the wrong direction. You know, it, it's crazy because it, it, out of all these signs that I've seen all across the nation, when we see something about domestic violence, there's never a guy on there. It's all of, always about a woman. It's painting her as the victim. And like listening to you guys, I've really been paying attention. Uh, we, we can have a guy on here that's went through some extreme stuff and people will listen to him. But if we have a woman on here that went through alienation, she goes viral. Like they'll start just pushing it out. And I'm like, What's going on here? Why are these fathers and these men not being listened to as much? What can we do as men, as fathers, to be taken a little bit more serious, guys? Yes. Warren? Yeah, I, I think the best thing, the, the easiest thing for men to do is to talk about how much they love the children that they're being alienated from talk about how they would have loved to use that $100,000 that they spent in the law courts for their children's orthodontist bills, for their children's mental health problems, for their children's future college education, and talk about how uh, we, uh, how the man himself doesn't want the mom to be overwhelmed by being the primary parent of, of, of children um, 
and uh, and so and and talk about the lose lose situation that that a child being brought up by only one parent experiences. Uh, talk particularly about uh, allow the uh, allow people to know the the hard data also the hard data that when fathers roughhouse that they understand how it looks to the mother uh, that 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 yeah that the dad is only one more child but. Uh, let get men uh, introduce them to the type of stuff I talk about in the boy crisis book on the connection between roughhousing and creating empathy in children. The connection between roughhousing and teaching people children there's so, the difference between being um, assertive versus aggressive that then allows them to have more friends in school that then allows them to have less likelihood of of being depressed because they have more friends in school um, that gives them postponed gratification because they have to they have to not hurt their brother or their sister while they're roughhousing um, in multiple children um, and, and they have to think about their sister or brother's needs as they're roughhousing and that creates the empathy that creates the social skills that also creates the postponed gratification men we need to do our homework we need to know why we are valued not just as success objects but as parents as future fathers um, we, need, we need to know that there's about nine differences in dad style parenting and mom style parenting. And I, this was really an education to me when I did the research for the boy crisis that there were, there are so many differences and, and then connecting those differences to the hard data of how they increased empathy so that when we talk to our wives or our future ex-wives about the possibility um, of, um, you know, of what our role with the children is, our ex-wives uh, see that, uh, that we know what we're talking about, that the empathy, that the, the, the desire to raise our children is enhanced by our different styles, but yet that we also respect the, mother, the, the mother's style and that the, whether we're divorced or whether we're married, that, that it's important for both parenting styles to be used so that we have checks and balance parenting for children, whether they're in intact families or not intact families. And so we need to be talking about the benefits of the children. That is the, that is the most important, quick, sympathetic path, because otherwise, if we talk about what's hurting us, we are, we are working against the biological instinct to, uh, to prepare men to be disposable in order to be our heroes and our protectors. Um, and so let's start with our being partners in the protector role of children. That's an easier biological step for the average person to hear. I'll add to that too, when, when reaching people, one of the things that Warren has always done in his work is go sort of going with this resistance to hearing men's issues, he talks directly to mothers. He pulls them into the conversation because if you're not talking to them as women, if you're talking to them as mothers or wives or sisters about the significant men in their lives, then you find they're going to listen a lot. Uh, they're a lot more prone to listen than if you just make this a generic conversation about men's issues, talking to a woman. The other thing I want to say is that I go with that resistance a lot too. I don't ever see the development of a society that will overcome this bias, this empathy gap that we have between the sexes. I don't ever see that happening. I don't think it's possible. So what I've tried to do in my work all these years is reach out directly to men who are being affected by these issues. They're the ones most likely to listen. Um, and I know that that isn't a real encouraging message because what I'm saying is that talking to the world, trying to grab the world's attention and say, look at these suffering men, I think it's a waste of time. I, I really do. Um, the world doesn't care about men and men's issues, but there are people in the world. And I think enough people in the world that can care to make a real difference. It's not overwhelming majorities of people that change perception socially. It's very loud vocal minorities that rattle cages and that reach people who feel alone. And God knows there is a ton of men out there that feel isolated and screwed over and resentful and bitter. Some of them 
now are planning suicide as a way to deal with it. The more you guys are doing this kind of thing, reaching out and you're getting those guys, those angry guys in your comments that you are asking what to do with. Yes, sir. It means what you're doing is working. You're reaching those guys. And now you can grab them and bring them in, find a place to give them a voice where they can tell their story. Um, yeah. Very powerful stuff happens with that. Absolutely. I would like to bring up one thing and see both your reactions on it. Uh, you know, my mind always goes to the media and Hollywood. If you were to take any uh, show that's on TV or maybe a movie, the role of the father or the man in a lot of these sitcoms is the goofball. The wife's in charge. Uh, you know, he always does stupid things or he likes, you know, uh, stereotypical manly stuff. Uh, do you guys feel that that you know, maybe Hollywood and some of the programming that we've seen has contributed to, uh, you know, the problems that us as men are facing. Because when I think about it, I, I look, I used, when I was growing up, there was a TV show called Growing Pains. And I really always admired how uh, the two parents in that show work together. But you don't really see that on TV now. You see the guy is the goofball. Oh, he did something silly again. Oh, you know, what a goof. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Do you think that's kind of influencing society? Absolutely. We've gone from father knows best to father knows less. And, um, and it's really been a very sad transition because our children have lost in the process and, and men don't sort of look at, look at TV and look at The Simpsons, for example, and say, oh, I can really be a hero in the future. I'm really needed. Um, you know, uh, fathers can really be so effective in, in, um, in, the, in the world. Um, we, you know, so part of what we need to do is to um, those of us who are gifted in writing to begin to write movie scripts uh, that that have this. Um, we have, you know, we have now an opportunity that we've never had in history before, which is with thousands and thousands of different outlets, like the outlet that the two of you have created here. We have we have um, a place to show things and air things. You know, I, I wrote a, a, an op-ed piece um, on the, for USA Today. It was rejected by the other ma major um, uh, outlets like um, New, New York Times and Wa um, Wall Street Journal. And then, then it was accepted tentatively by the USA Today. And they put a feminist intern on it, um, and it was a he. And he just challenged me with every single sentence I wrote. And finally, it got through, and suddenly, that, that New York, that USA Today um, column became the number three most read column in uh, out of the 500 or so columns that USA Today printed in 2019. And suddenly now USA Today is going, whoa, uh, there's somebody here listening to this perspective uh, that was not, and whereas they thought it was just a completely irrelevant type of, you know, you know, people griping as a dad or griping for boys or griping for males and so on. So the type of, um, so we need to encourage dads to create um, additional material that if it can't be aired in the mainstream, gets aired in enough, enough places like uh, on, on your dad talk. And, um, and then the, the, and the, when they become viral, they become of interest to commercialize mainstreams because basically, what commercials, uh, what commercialized TV and radio care about, is how you know how much the audience is. So therefore, how big is the um, the advertising pocketbook? And so, uh, and we must have courage to be rejected. You know, when I started to do a speak up on behalf of boys and men, I lost more than you know I had fifty to fifty five speaking engagements per year um, that I was receiving very significant money from, and I sort of saw which way it was going to go. And I started to work very carefully on developing business skills to invest that money so I'd be able to survive the process of going from 50 speaking engagements a year to zero speaking engagements a year. So if, you know, when Cassie J did the red pill and she got, and she started realizing that she, that, that there was something that she hadn't been listening to the men that were talking until she read the transcript and she walked with me and she said, you know, Warren, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my feminist friends that I built up in my lifetime. And I said, Cassie, I can guarantee you that you will. And that, you know, you, so you have to choose between, you have the courage to produce this film anyway, even though you will lose about 99% of your feminist friends, but you will gain a new cadre of people who really need you and who really need to have, have, have um, to be heard. 
and you will enter into providing, uh, you will fill a vacuum that it is enormous, wide, lonely vacuum that has been built on men's, the lack of permission men have to express their feelings, say who they are, and knowing that when they do, they're only pitied, they're not really understood. And so you will enter that vacuum and you will provide an enormously powerful service to the world. Are you willing to do that? And she ultimately said, yes, she was. And, you know, and hence we have the red pill. That is awesome. And, you know, just going back to what we were talking about, seeing the women on the domestic violence bulletin boards and half of domestic violence happens to men. What's that say about the value for men right now? You know, it's, do we deserve it? Is it just something, oh, it doesn't hurt us. You know, it's, it's crazy. But it, I would really like to say thank you, gentlemen, for doing what you're doing and what you have been doing. And uh, Dr. Farrell, you spoke a little bit about it, but I was curious, what are some of the challenges that both of you have faced for sticking up for men? Well, um, until Paul Elam came along, <laughs> I just disappeared into the woodworks for uh, quite a while. And, um, and sort of I had to really live off of, um, to a large degree of the monies that um, I, that a much smaller percentage of money than the monies I'd somewhat saved from the women's movement. So it is one of the great ironies uh, that the women's movement has in the long run helped me um, be able to be free, to be able to say things that I felt were good about men. And um, since Paul Elam spoke up and, um, and the red pill has come out and, um, and some of um, the boy crisis book has sold well, um, I have, um, you know, it's been a much more uh, frugal existence, although um, I, do, I am fortunate enough to be, uh, to have saved up enough and my wife is a good earner. And so we do live in a very beautiful home. And so it's not a, um, really not a challenge anymore. And I just I like to point you. out, Go the, ahead. The, earlier we, we, Paul had said there'd be no Paul Elam without Dr. Warren Farrell. And what Dr. Farrell just said was there would be no Dr. Warren Farrell without Paul Elam. So that's <laughs> that's amazing. And and, and I, that, that, I just hope our audience took that in and realized that. Uh, go ahead, Paul. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, Does that no, mean you're my all... jelly too, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. It'd no, no I want to say, guess what? No uh, no Chris. I haven't lost anything. I have lost, I have gained everything from doing what I've done. It depends, I guess, on how you look at it. Certainly, there, I've been attacked by just about every major news media or, or media outlet, uh, pretty much spanning the Western world. There's been hit pieces. There's been people digging into my past. There's been people writing a lot of stuff about me, some of it true, most of it not. But guess what? Um, there's not a day, a single day, that I don't hear from somebody who tells me that my work has impacted their life for the better. Um, I have a, a beautiful, wonderful partner of 18 years who has stood by me all the way through this, uh, especially in the early days. You know, I don't know if people know this or not, but you don't get rich doing this, as Warren has pointed out. Nobody's getting, and I'm sure you guys know, okay. no, it, this is never going to be a rags to riches story over men's issues. But I sleep at night like a baby. I get to look at myself in the mirror and feel proud of what I do, proud of standing up for the truth, um, and proud of taking an unpopular stand that I get persecuted for, knowing that there's nothing they can do to me. There, there's really literally nothing. What am I going to do? Be worried about, I, I generally think that modern feminism has turned into a cult of liars. Am I going to worry about what a cult of liars says about me uh, in the media? No. Uh, I feel great about what I do. I wouldn't do anything different. Well, I probably would. I would have started a little bit sooner. I would have had Warren write the myth of male power and, and release it in 83 instead of 93. Uh, that would have been my preference. But other than that, I wouldn't change a thing. And Paul, talking about the smear campaign that, you know, the media has done to you, I think we did a pretty good job. And last time it went over some people's head when we did our little icebreaker <laughs> oh, yeah, with I you talking about that, your though. mom. And <laughs> I, I felt great that some of the guys wanted to defend me because they thought the questioning was yeah. unfair, but they, they didn't. They just didn't get that it was uh, it was facetious. 
respect. We were giving you respect and showing what the media has done to you. It was a little bit of sarcasm pointed back at the mainstream media. But guys, we are all out of time. I would like to say thank you to both of you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And hopefully we can have you back in the future. And I, I, I can speak for Chris and myself when I say we are so honored to be able to sit here and have the knowledge that you have gained through the years and to be able to just even share the same podcast with you. And I hope uh, we're going to try to do our part and that we make you proud. And you're already say, doing that. Indeed. And, and Chris and, and Eric, may I say that for your supporters, uh, that you are going to be um, assisting me um, on Father's Day weekend in, um, in, in South Car in North Carolina, I think at the Art of Living Research Center, um, um, uh, Re Resort Center. And so if you, uh, if you wish to find out about that, go on my website, warrenferrell.com and meet Eric and Chris that you're speaking or you're hearing today and we'll all, we'll all be there um, talking, uh, doing a weekend on the boy crisis. And, uh, and if there's Farrell. any lawyers out there or other business people not sponsoring Dad Talk, um, get with the program, guys. Sponsor these guys, help them out, help them get this message out. Means, that means a lot. I'll tell you what, yeah, th thank you guys. And Dr. Farrell, thank you for breaking that news. We will be there at the boy conference, uh, the boy crisis um, retreat center, center in, in June. June. We will give you guys the information. If you'd like to attend that conference, you'll get to meet me and Chris live and Dr. Warren Farrell. There is another speaker that's going to be there with you. What's his name, Dr. Farrell? His name is Troy Kemp, and he is a wonderful, charismatic speaker. I hear a lot of people speak, and he is uh, like Paul Elam, one of the best. And so he's good. And he's an African American that has had a lot of contact with poor boys and, and middle class and upper middle class boys, a lot of hands on experience. And I think you'll find that and he's wonderful with anecdotes and stories. Um, I hope I bring something to the, the, the table with some of the um, research that I've done and the work that I've done and my own anecdotes. And so I think the two of us together will create a, a wonderful weekend and it will be a, a small weekend. We will not let the, the numbers get too big. It'll probably, probably be attended by 40, 50 people. Uh, so we'll have a chance to get to know you rather than just um, look at, out at you in the distance in an audience. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank hey, you. could you give me real quick, give me a plug to your website and where people can find you? Olelum.com. And I couldn't remember anything more complicated either, easy, either. so it's warrenferrell.com or theboycrisis.org. There's two websites. If you want to go to the Boy Crisis book there, and if you want to get the Boy Crisis book, um, it's the least expensive on Amazon, but if you have enough money to be able to afford it, um, go to support your local bookstore. And I've been getting more as many comments that are positive about the audible version of it where I spent five days reading the book. Um, and uh, so did John Gray read his part of the book um, uh, um, uh, on ADHD, which is really a good, set of, uh, a good set of chapters on how to prevent ADHD without uh, using medications. And so I hope the boy crisis serves you well. Awesome. Wow. That's worth Fellas, it. thank you so much. And you got also got a voice for men. We didn't get to plug that one. So I'm going to throw that one in there too. Oh, that's, that's fine. We're still there, still kicking. All right. All right, guys. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next pleasure. time. Take Paul, care. A real pleasure to be with you again, Paul. Thank yes, you. Warren. You take care. You look great, by the way. Well, thank you very much. Your beard isn't as good as mine, but you know, <laughs> the rest of your face is good. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to stand up to the biggest man. <laughs> guys, take care. Right. Thank you, Bye -bye. Paul.